the cost is astronomical. There's billions of dollars spent on the war on drugs. I don't think we have a clue of the, just the, the devastation that addiction brings I, I, with the, within families. Something's not right. I don't know what it is, but something is not right. Something is, is missing in me. Hi, I'm Laverne Tripp and welcome to Born to be Free. Have you ever wondered why some of us eat too much, drink too much, smoke too much, shop too much, spend too much? We're addicted and we know what we're doing is destructive, but we can't stop. Some of you watching know exactly what I'm talking about because you personally are affected and some of you have tried to stop and you can't, like me. But you know what? It costs billions of dollars. And I know you know that, not only in money, but the cost in dreams being shattered, the cost in lives being shattered, families being shattered. But there is a solution. Starting this week, we're going to show you the problem, but we want you to stay with us because we found the solution. Because you know what? We were born to be free. America, the land of the free. Some would call it ironic that in a nation where we have the liberty to live as we choose, millions of us are enslaved by addiction. Alcohol, drugs, gambling, pornography, these are just some of the prisons in which we live. And it affects all of us, to the cost of a quarter trillion dollars a year. But how do you put a price tag on lives lost, families disrupted, and human potential wasted? Please. Take the next few minutes and listen to the brave men and women who tackle this problem every day and still ask themselves, what is the answer? Uh, man has always sought some means of altering his mind in order to seek pleasure. And we've dealt with this for thousands of years. Well, the cost is astronomical. There's billions of dollars spent on the war on drugs and uh, the salaries the court expenses, the overtime, uh, the cost of just going out and buying drugs uh, is in the billions. The cost to our society for drug abuse exceeds $150 billion, and it includes social costs, social welfare costs, costs for treatment, criminal system costs, criminal justice costs, as well as health care costs and loss to workplace productivity. I don't think we have a clue of the, just the, the devastation that addiction brings I, I, with the, within families. Uh, everyone who comes into treatment is connected with somebody. Well, I think there's a big stigma attached to the word addiction, and nobody, quote, wants to be associated with people that have addiction. And it, I, for some reason, I guess we, you know, a sin is, is a sin, um, and addiction is, is an addiction. We, we tend to hierarchy, we put things in some type of hierarchy. An addiction is an addiction is an addiction. Uh, the only thing that changes is the agent, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, because the basic principles of management are exactly the same for chemicals as they are for gambling, or for uh, sex, or whatever. You could be addicted to television, you could be addicted to the internet, which is a big one. Caffeine addiction, I think I have that one. I've been going to Starbucks a lot. I think we've only scratched the surface in, in really bringing people to an awareness of, of their lives and, and of, of um, what's controlling them.
that from a law enforcement standpoint, we are not going to win the war on drugs. The police are not going to win this war. And we're not, we can't put every narcotics addict in jail. We treat them, yes. We, we treat them and we treat them and we treat them and we continue to treat them. But even the treatment phase is insufficient to break the cycle. And Dr. Carl Jung, who's one of our most famous psychiatrists of all times, he himself said that he could not cure alcoholism, that he said that medicine doesn't have the answer. What is it about this culture of addiction that brings our lifestyle to control us? More counseling, more police, more education, more medication, more churches, and the problem has only gotten worse. Perhaps we need to look at addiction in a different light, one that examines the very nature of who we are and who God is. For whatever reason, people, because of their lifestyle, develop some areas that are, they're very uncomfortable with. In an attempt to relieve it, they look for outlets. I think all of the addictions have the exact components that they all represent us trying to fill a void within ourselves, that somehow we have something missing inside us and we think only if we have this one more drink, only if we have this new dress, only if we get one more win at the horse races, that somehow we'll be fulfilled and fill this void in ourselves. And so we're constantly looking and we want it really fast. I think we have a whole culture that's addicted to having things really fast, right away, now. And that's a, it's a spiritual problem. You don't just start out being an alcoholic or addicted to crack. I mean, it starts in small ways and then it, it, it just grows. It, it also becomes a physical addiction, but we believe it starts off as a spiritual need that you try to, that you try to fail. But people know that something's not right. I don't know what it is, but something is not right. Something is, is missing in me. And I don't know what it is. Ultimately, our approach to human problems has to address the spiritual need of the woman or the man who has the problem. Ultimately, we are created for intimacy with God. And if that intimacy isn't intact, we can't hope to fully resolve the human problems that come about as a result of the lack of that intimacy. So ultimately, while we can see addiction to alcohol, drugs, pornography, or gambling as being problems in their own right, the root of those problems lies in the individual's inability to relate properly first to God, then to others, and then to himself. And that means ultimately this has to be addressed as a spiritual problem. Could it be that simple? Is it possible that God alone has the power to set us free? Before you answer, give us a few weeks to tell you the incredible stories of former addicts and the principles that have brought them true freedom. In fact, these principles have worked since the beginning of time. In 1938, Alcoholics Anonymous drafted its legendary 12 Steps for Recovery. Although difficult to calculate, many researchers believe the success rate of those early AA groups could have been as high as 75 percent. This is at least triple the recovery rate for today's secular treatment programs. Where did these 12 steps come from? Could the principles behind the steps be partly responsible for AA's early success rates? More importantly, what can these principles teach us in treating the problem of addiction in our culture today? Dick B. is a recovered alcoholic and a leading historian on the spiritual roots of Alcoholics Anonymous. In keeping with AA's famous tradition of anonymity, Dick asked to keep his identity hidden. If you want to change your life, if you want to, change, to help change somebody else, you never drink again. That's it. That was their message. It's, I won't drink anymore. God help me. I'm going to do my best to obey you, and I'm going to help other people, and it changes all of us. We become different people. We begin our story in 1908, 27 years before AA was formed. A Lutheran youth minister from Philadelphia, Frank Buchmann, was visiting Europe 
not aware of the life-changing encounter that was about to hit him. He was still steaming over a violent argument with his board of trustees concerning a budgetary issue. In anger, Buchman resigned and was determined to take charge of his own affairs. But that changed in England, where at a church conference, Frank Buchman had a spiritual experience that would transform the course of his life. I began to see myself as God saw me, which was a very different picture of the way I saw myself. I realized how my pride, my selfishness, had eclipsed me from God. I was the center of my own life. It was up to me to change. I had to begin. Frank Buchman was true to his word and immediately wrote a letter of forgiveness to each of his trustees. My dear friend, I have nursed ill feelings against you. I am sorry. Will you forgive me? Sincerely, Frank. Buchman began to theorize that a life of moral integrity had the power to bring societal transformation. Eager to tell others this good news, Buchman toured England, leaving behind small support groups in universities, churches, and homes. Modeled after the first century church, these groups would come to be known as Oxford groups and ignited a movement that quickly spread across the globe. James Houck spent 30 years as an Oxford member under Frank Buchman. He was always talking about new men, new nations, a new world. You, you see, uh, what Buchman was trying to do was to narrow the gap between what people say they believe and the way they live. The principles of the groups were simple and reflected Buchman's Christian ideology. Complete honesty, moral purity, unselfishness, unconditional love. You had to make a decision to entrust your life to God's care and to stop focusing on the big I, the self. And then they were to say, where have I fallen short and who have I harmed? So that process of self-examination became a biggie in the Oxford group and a biggie in AA. And the next thing was that the Oxford group believed that you had to admit those sins, uh, those shortcomings, to God, to yourself, and to another human being. It wasn't long before the movement spread to the United States and found itself headquartered at Reverend Sam Shoemaker's church in New York City. Frank Buchman, fast becoming a celebrity, traveled extensively, preaching on the virtues of what was known as Buchmanism. In 1933, Buchman brought his message to the industrial city of Akron, Ohio. After the Oxford Group team left Akron, a lot of uh, the people who were impressed by it, including my mother and my grandmother, tried to continue uh, to meet periodically and share their experiences with each other and uh, to really help each other carry out the Oxford Group uh, meaning of life. Some of Akron's finest citizens attended the meetings, including members of the Firestone family, Goodyear tire mogul F.A. Cyberling's daughter-in-law Henrietta, and a beloved Akron doctor, Bob Smith. As with earlier Oxford groups, this small group of Christians in Akron studied biblical devotions, loved and prayed with each other, and confessed hidden struggles, all except Dr. Bob. Although it was quietly known that Bob Smith was an alcoholic, he kept his struggles private from the group until the spring of 1935. Then, in true Oxford group fashion, Bob opened up, surrendering his problem to God and, with the group's help, prayed to stop his addiction. Their prayer would be answered in a remarkable way. And that's the point at which my mother got a telephone call one day from uh, uh, a man who said, uh, uh, my name is Bill Wilson. I'm a drunk from New York, and uh, I need help. On the other side of town in the Mayflower Hotel, another alcoholic was making a similar plea for help. A Wall Street stockbroker and supposed hopeless drunk, Bill Wilson attended Sam Shoemaker's Oxford Group in New York. Through Reverend Shoemaker's influence, Bill Wilson discovered a life without alcohol through the principles of repentance, forgiveness, and helping other drunks. But now on a business trip to Akron and away from the dozens of drunks he was trying to cure, 
Bill Wilson had the sudden urge to have a drink. Instead of going into the hotel bar, Wilson scanned a nearby church directory, hoping to be directed to an alcoholic in need, his only hope of staying sober. Randomly picking a name, he called the Reverend Walter Tunks. And somehow, from Tunks, Bill got in touch with Henrietta Cyberling. His feeling was, if I don't work with a drunk, I'll drink. And so Henrietta grasped that, and uh, she said, I've got a pip for you. Dr. Bob. Henrietta Cyberling immediately scheduled a meeting between Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith at her Gate Lodge home, hoping the two could help each other. Within two months, Dr. Bob would have the last drink of his life. Through this friendship, Alcoholics Anonymous was formed as the two passed on the good news to others. A few years later, the 12 steps were written, incorporating the very themes that Bill and Bob discovered through the Oxford groups the very same principles that Frank Buchman and countless others found in the Bible. In this book lie the principles of brokenness, surrender, confession, forgiveness, principles of healing, of freedom. As Bill Wilson once said, We never apologize to anyone for depending upon our Creator. Who invented AA? It was God Almighty that invented AA. I never wanted to do anything but sing. That's all I ever wanted to do. Sang my first song publicly when I was two and a half years old, and I've been singing ever since. My first drink was 16 years old. It wasn't long after that first drink that I got drunk my first time, and uh, I hugged the commode throwing up, you know. I felt like my bones were coming out of my mouth, my chest, and I said, God, if you won't kill me, I won't ever do this again. I don't know when I drank again, but I certainly did. He was able to hide his alcoholism for a while. And then the alcohol led to marijuana. He maintained a little bit, you know, with the marijuana. And then he got, he snorted cocaine. And then all of these drugs changes your habits. And I saw him slowly, slowly going down. And then when he started doing the rock cocaine, it totally changed his behavior. Totally, totally. Couldn't help it. I'd been high for two years, not every day, 24 hours a day. I wouldn't go to bed unless the joints were already rolled for the next day. I had to have at least 20 joints rolled. And uh, I would use the pipe and a bag just to dip it in and smoke. And I remember sitting in the hotel room in Nashville after I'd received the reward. I sat there with, I've been vocal male vocalist of the year, songwriter of the year. And I sat there with the trophies and a bottle of Jack Daniels and I said, is this it? Is this it? He would tell me he was going for a loaf of bread and he'd be gone for three days. And I've laid in my bed at night and, uh, I'm sorry. I've laid in my bed at night and, uh, when he would leave. And I would cry out to God. And I'd say, God, don't let him get killed tonight. Don't let him get caught by the cops. Don't let the cops come and knock on my door tonight and say he's dead. That night when I, I got on the bus, we rode from Birmingham, Alabama to Jonesboro, Louisiana. We were singing the next day with Governor Jimmy Davis. We sang a lot with Governor Davis. And I got on the bus that night. I didn't drink anything. I didn't do any drugs. I went straight to my bunk. And I prayed. It was the first time I'd prayed in a long time. And the prayer I prayed was this. I said, God, if you're real, if heaven's real, if hell is real, if everything I was taught and I once believed, if that's true, please help me. And I went to sleep. It's the first time I've been to sleep without drugs in two years. When I woke up the next morning, still in my bunk on the bus, 
I heard a voice, whether it was inside of me or outside, I don't know, but I heard a voice say to me, ask and you shall receive. I knew that voice. I had heard that voice when I was a kid, but I hadn't heard it in a long time because I'd hardened my heart so hard. And I started arguing with him. I said, there's no need for me to ask you to forgive me. I, I can't stop drinking. I can't stop drugging. I can't stop lying. I can't stop doing all the things. He didn't say anything else. And finally, I just kind of got quiet and I said, will you forgive me? I didn't think he would. The only way I know to describe it was like an elephant's foot was on my chest. It came off. It was like chains had me bound. They fell off. I felt like I had been washed inside out and I, I knew God had forgiven me of every sin I had ever committed. I was so happy. Got home the next day, got in my car, started to town, and instead of going to town, I turned and started to the drug dealer's house. I tried to pray, I tried to think of scriptures. I make a long story short, I got high. Same thing happened the next day. After I got high the next day, there's no hope for me. After I got high the second day, I had a bottle of sleeping pills and I went to the office, I locked the door, got me a glass of water, and I, I decided I'd kill myself. Just before I took the pills, the telephone rang. And uh, I picked it up, and it was a guy that I used to sing with, and we'd done a lot of bad things together. And I hadn't talked to him in a year, because a year before then he gave his heart to Jesus, so we didn't have anything to talk about. He called me, and uh, he said, how you doing? And I said, I'm doing fine. I don't think any of us want to admit that we don't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I was totally a wreck. Here I had just surrendered to God, meant to serve Him all my life. Now I've already gotten high. Now I'm fixing to kill myself. And somebody calls and says, how you doing? And I say, I'm fine. Crazy. Insanity. He said, hold it. He said, don't you realize what you're doing wrong? I said, no. I d yeah, I know what I'm doing wrong, but I don't know what to do. He said, don't you know you don't have any power over drugs? You don't have any power over alcohol. You don't have any power over the flesh. You don't have any power over the world. He said, you don't have any power over anything. I didn't realize how powerless I was. And uh, the only way I know to describe it, it felt like somebody wrapped a blanket around me and I knew I'd found the key to overcoming. And it was faith, knowing that I was powerless, but knowing if I'd surrender to his power, he would give it to me. And our marriage is so strong now and so healthy now. I have such a good husband. He's totally changed. Instead of being mean and violent and allowing the drugs to control his life, he now lets God control his life. Healing's here right now. Healing's here right now. There's no need to wait for another place or time healing's here right now. we live in a culture of addiction we all know someone who's addicted in some way or is dealing with some life controlling issue that keeps them from being the person god intended them to be whether it's a hardcore addiction like drugs or pornography, or simply a personality flaw like arrogance or stubbornness, these addictions come at a great cost, not only to those with the problem, but also to the ones they love. Over the next 12 weeks, we will present solid foundational principles that can help those struggling to overcome any addiction. We'll discuss these principles with our panel of recovering addicts from several different walks of life. We'll also bring you many incredible stories of people who have discovered the secret to overcoming their life controlling issues. Whether struggling with drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, pornography, gambling, shopping, overeating, dieting, or some other compulsion, they all found hope in the midst of their pain. Even in my addiction, I can remember when I hit bottom, I would pray and thank God that I was broke, that I had no money, because that was the only way that I wouldn't use. While this series alone isn't the answer to overcoming addictions, it can bring awareness to the issues controlling your life and point you in the right direction to find help. 
Throughout every program, we'll provide information that will connect you to a nearby organization where you can continue your road to recovery and build relationships with people who care for you and can bring you hope. So won't you join us on this journey as we show you how to discover, contemplate, and break the chains of your addiction. Remember, you were born to be free. Well, I hope you have been given some hope because that's what we need. If we lose our hope, we've lost everything. Let new hope arise in you. You've watched my story. And let's believe together and agree together right now that for the next 13 weeks, we're going to grow. The one that created us has a plan for us. And that plan is we were born to be free. Have you been inspired to start your journey to recovery? Please call our toll-free number, 888-665-4483. And our prayer partners can help you find a group in your area. Or you can visit our website at www.ctvn.org and click on the Born to be Free link. There you can search our online database of recovery groups near you. When you call or visit our website, request your free copy of the self-help booklet, Your Dynamic Journey to Freedom. In it, you'll find an outline of the recovery process featured in this series. So take that first step on your journey to freedom by contacting us, finding a local recovery group, and getting your free copy of this inspiring booklet. Call now, because you were born to be free. When I was a kid, I thought that if I could control things, that I'd be safe. But, but then when the addiction came, I wouldn't admit it, I, that I had lost control. Of course, if we didn't lose control, we wouldn't be addicted. So I was just pretty much a social drinker, and it was accepted in the circles that I ran in. So um, I pretty much had control, I thought. I was trying to control then that thing that I thought defined who I was, but, um, but in actuality, it was controlling me. I believe behind all forms of addictive behavior, addiction to pornography, addiction to chemicals, addiction to alcohol, any form of bondage, if you will, I believe there is a legitimate desire, a desire for intimacy, a desire for connection, a desire for validation. I think desire is behind life-dominating behavior, and the desire will not leave just because the person has repented of that behavior. Well, I believe that the materialism that we have in our culture really can't, um, as I said earlier, fill that void inside ourselves, that we need something with much more meaning, which only God can fill. 